yeah. a while back. So it's so, here. Oh, we got what we do guys. here at SPC? We've got an email list. We've got a website. Uh, if you find anything that's cobwebby mm -hmm. or wrong on the website, tell Dave Jaffe, the webmaster. Wait, raise your hand, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that, Dave. I didn't mean to give me more words. I don't see where I'm running. Charlie Delta. We are still making faces as we stare at the audio Look processor. Look at the receiver to make sure the lights went back. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I didn't want to give anybody that idea that everything runs smoothly, smoothly and it's a well-oiled machine. Even after all these years, you know, <laughs> come on. So the battery in my Google Glass finally died. I should have brought the dead one today and at least worn it while I, while I talk, but I think it's down a couple layers of boxes and I'm going to find it. I've also Then you know it's each day of life. So I need to, I need to re try to replace it. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Can anybody out in Radio Land hear me? Radio One, Land. two, three. Yes. Okay. Just go ahead and see it. Edit. Brad, am I good to go? Uh. You know, I think we need to. Yeah, yeah, You're getting him. Okay, go go ahead. I think we're. I think we're. Something's okay, not right on this end. I'm Henry Strickland. Uh, the, the web page here is at wiki.yak.net. Colon. No, I'm sorry. Slash one one three three. Five years ago, six years ago, back in uh, 2014, uh, I had my Google Glass and I was having fun with it. And I wrote some software for it. You could either do it in Python if it was simple enough, or you could write it like an Android app if you wanted to do more complicated programming for Glass. But I wanted to do some programming on Glass. So I thought Forth would be a good language that if I'm walking down the street from, I don't know, here to Treseder, and I want to uh, do some programming while I'm walking, I could dictate to my Glass. And naturally, I chose Forth because or a fourth-like language because um, I want just short utterances. I don't want you know like huge, huge expressions that I have to have to read out huge function definitions. Um, but then I migrated towards Joy because in Joy, which calls itself fourth functional cousin, it really is just words, numbers, and brackets. Whereas in fourth, there's lots of punctuation, and Google didn't really understand all that punctuation, and also, um, memory is not an issue. Like Python, you can have elements that are lists of other things. Um, so I was going to say, and, and back then, Google's dictation was not as good as it is today, because that's what would do the, the, the recognition for the glass. And I found that gerunds are, under, are easier to understand than imperatives. So rather than saying dupe and drop, I would say duping and dropping. <laughs> and you can kind of hear, also it brings out the final consonant on the, on the imperatives when you add the ing. And also it gave me the easiest choice of what my extension should be for my files, which contain gerund. <coughs> it was an obvious three-letter extension. Um, so things I found surprisingly difficult. Naming is hard. When we name our variables and our functions, they're... Uh, Often words that Google doesn't know, like you couldn't name one of these things and have, and have Google understand it. So I came up with a couple of mechanisms to get around that. And um, one is to use first, second, third after a word. So I could say Henry the first, Henry the second, Henry the third, and those would uh, become new words. And the other was to use with. So I could say I could define a function. Reducing with adding, reducing with multiplying, reducing with concatenating, and those would become a word. Also, it helps to ignore some stock words and the word number, and also helps me run things together. For instance, I could say the number four, and that would be understood better than four because four is kind of ambiguous. Although I handle a lot of the ambiguous cases as well. 
So I only have two kinds of things that I do in the rep on those commands and expressions. And the primary command is to define a new word. Also, list will list all the words. You can list an individual word, and you can show the definitions. And then some stuff for testing. And in order to uh, create graphs, or I wanted some, something you know, beyond just an expression result, uh, I came up with a mechanism for drawing things using triangles. And I already had a triangle server on the internet that you give it a URL with a bunch of numbers of the coordinates of the triangles and their colors, and it would give you back a PNG file. So I made my uh, interpreter understand that if the result is ever a list of lists, and those inner lists have exactly nine things, that that's uh, three corners and a red, blue, green value for triangles. And it would display this in the Google Glass. I would see the the image like that. And that's, a, that's an actual uh, one that I did from glass. I did uh, array operations like in APL so that uh, any of my binary and unary arithmetic operators would, would operate element wise on arrays. And I'll show you the that didn't work. Maybe I'm not on the net. Okay, I might have fallen off the net. But uh, all right, it's probably those four-hour things. Anyway, here's the code for uh, priming. And this certainly should have been broken down into uh, smaller functions. But duplicating, counting, opening, getting the second, swapping, modulo, the number zero, equaling, closing, mapping, summing, the number two, equaling, swapping, popping. That's what I would say if I wanted to do those operations. Now, opening and closing are quote marks. They're like the, the square brackets in joy. And so from this opening to that closing, that's the argument to mapping. That's the function that mapping is going to map over uh, counting, which produces a list of 1 to n. It takes a number n, and it, it's like iota. It gives you the, it gives you the list. So that's the flavor of joy. And I had some other examples on the web where I uh, show you a bunch of little functions that are named Alice 1 through Alice 9. And they end up drawing, uh, that's the Alice 9. That's the original triangle, Alice 8. Those are the three affine maps that uh, define the fractal. And here's the original triangle Alice 9, and the transform Alice 8 and Alice 6 applies the transform, and now I'm at that stage in Sierpinski's gasket. And uh, you just chain more Alice 8 and Alice 6s, and you can make the, the fractal. So that's... Um, that's uh, five minutes worth. Hey. Are you going to come back and tell us more about this at some uh, future date? Yeah, we'll have a deep dive and, and, and homework assignments at a future date. Probably January. I think a December. Uh, I'm already occupied with stuff. All right. Still on. Microphone.
And so I would encourage you to do so. And I think, yes, it's now time. Alrighty. Welcome to the afternoon. I'm Greg, um, and this is the Green Arrays period for the next hour and 45 minutes until Chuck takes over with his wonderful fireside chat. So welcome to Cheyenne, Wyoming, a wonderful town to live in, wonderful town to work in. doesn't cost us any money to be here. You don't have any BS to put up with it from our state. It's really nice. All right, so... What are the wonderful things about Cheyenne? To, uh, this year, I got to go and personally witness the first live run, passenger carrying run of Union Pacific steam engine 4014, the last and only big boy still operating on rails in the United States and probably in the world since I don't think there were any exported. The big boy is a 4884 steam engine with two completely different steam drives on the two groups of eight drive wheels, and it's a glorious thing to see. And so it was on its way off to Provo, Utah to reenact the driving of the Golden Spike. And it's now uh, making whistle stops in Oklahoma, and it should be home in another week or so. Made a big uh, two-month two -month trip. That's a glorious thing. Uh, unfortunately, you would have had to have been in Los Angeles to see it on your side of the coast. And another wonderful thing about Cheyenne is that because I'm a member of the local IEEE unit, I was invited to come down to the 100th anniversary celebration for WWV. And, uh, that was wonderful. That was brilliant. And I also ran across somebody I knew there, Brett Glass, who used to be the HackersCon guy. And he's now running an ISP in Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, he saw the light, too. At any rate, uh, I'm going to throw up some slides here and just sort of introduce what we're going to be doing for the next hour and 45, after which I'll hand off to Daniel's video, which will go on for about an hour, and then he will take questions, and then we'll come back and yak some more. Here we go with the screen share. Hopefully this will work, and hopefully it will be legible. And if that doesn't look really good and crisp on what's going out to the stream, then this is not going to be very good. But the first 15 minutes is scheduled to be me doing this stuff, and then Daniel comes up with his wonderful application. And a Q&A, if necessary or desirable after that. And finally, I will speak for a while on what we've been doing for the last year at Green Arrays. The status of our company is that after the capital contribution we received in June, July of 2018, we are solvent, we have no debt, and my gosh, we have a balance sheet that would even make a VC happy to look at, maybe. However, we had some setbacks. There is an entity at University of Southern California called MOSIS Service. They claim to be a service. They used to be funded by the federal government of the United States, and now they're a private enterprise. And apparently MOSIS thinks everyone that they deal with is also funded by the government. MOSIS has the enviable position of being basically the monopoly holder of access to public services by public access foundries in the world, if you're a United States resident company. Uh, MOSIS basically organizes access to shuttle runs. They actually organize getting masks made. They organize getting wafer runs made. And they organize getting chips assembled. And MOSIS has decided that, among other things, they don't see any reason why they should provide shuttle runs at the foundry we use and which we've qualified, namely the 180 nanometer industry compatible foundry of um, Global Foundries, which used to be uh, 
a company in Singapore. And they also won't send dye to the assembly house we've qualified in Chengdu, China. Now, the services we get from the assembly house in Chengdu cost us about 40 cents a chip. The assembly services that are available to us with a very similar package in Silicon Valley are only like five bucks a chip. This makes a difference. Furthermore, not only will Moses not allow us to make a shuttle run through them at our foundry, which means we have to change everything like GDS2 mass player numbers and everything else just to get stuff run at a different foundry. They also will not provide us access to a shuttle run at the only other foundry we're interested in, which is that of on semiconductor. Turns out that on semiconductors, 180 nanometer industry compatible CMOS process has been qualified by Nantero to run Nantero's carbon nanotube memories. And we would just dearly love to make a chip with carbon nanotube memories on it, both for the bulk memory and, hell, even maybe for our own internal SRAM and our nodes. But, alas, Moses will not organize a shuttle run for us there either. So it's kind of hard to see what service Moses is providing for us, but the problem is that in addition to denying us access to just about everything that we actually know how to work with, they also tripled the price for shuttle runs. They increased by better than 20 to 25 percent the cost of running masks, even though, of course, these are mature processes, right? And uh, they also nearly doubled the cost to us of wafers. So, yeah, it's a great service they, they provide. At any rate, that changed our economics. We don't necessarily have the funds to make a new chip. And we certainly don't have access to a foundry at which we know our work will work. So we're back to pretty much square one in many respects, and we are going to have to find new ways to do that. We've also created polysense, which is something I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And we've been doing a lot of work on our own internal tools and the ones that we provide to people, a new eval board, a new suite of tools, as well as a significant application project, a GPS receiver. So this is all fun. What Polysense is about is, uh, well, let's just read it together, the purposes. The corporation's purpose is to facilitate vocational training and education in the area of electronic computing, including programming and integrated circuit design, using the methods and approach to problem definition, analysis, and solution demonstrated by Charles H. Moore. These methods include the programming methodology named forth, and the silicon design tools and computers produced by Mr. Moore and his colleagues between the 1980s and the present time. The approach is heavily cross-disciplinary and is driven by first principles. Such education shall be provided initially by contracting the services of Mr. Moore and his colleagues, including both individuals and companies such as Forthink and Green Arrays Inc., who are skilled in the use of these methods and approaches and are available to teach. In the longer term, it's expected that the corporation will develop its own cadre and capability to carry on this work. We are currently in the process of applying for 501c3 status, which will mean that contributions to the polysense effort will be tax write offable. And in addition, that um, bequeaths or bequests to the nonprofit will be right offable. So who knows? The point of this exercise is that we're still not shipping chips in volume. We might possibly be doing so soon, but we must, we absolutely must clone ourselves. Chuck, Mark Schmader, and I are the only people that know how to do this with our tools and our methods, and we have to grow additional people that are younger than we are who are competent with this stuff. And so that is the key purpose of PolySense, to keep Chuck's technology and methods alive and in use by people that are of an age to be able to make good use of them. So we're, we're working on this. The, the goal for PolySense is to teach kids that the emperor has no clothes. We want to generate as many kids of high school and early college age 
as possible who have proven to themselves that you don't need an advanced degree to program or to design silicon. I know this for a fact. Everything that I've needed to use of electronic knowledge to work inside of our chips is stuff I knew in the 10th grade. I'm pretty sure that other kids in this country at this time are still smart enough to pick that stuff up. And so our goal will be to set up at, at least a summer program whereby uh, a, an assortment of kids scattered across the country can learn forth, can learn to design silicon our way, can actually make some test circuits which we will cause to be produced in silicon and packaged into chips that, that, that can be tested uh, and deliver silicon to the kids sometime around spring break in the year. That's the expensive, slow turnaround, relatively few kids method. We're also exploring lower tech, but still perfectly good pedagogical tools, such as a printing process that has been developed by a company in the UK that, that costs um, about a tenth as much to make masks for, and it takes more like um, two weeks of turnaround as opposed to six months of turnaround. And what it produces is um, lower resolution, but still submicron printed chips uh, using thin film transistors. Perfectly good pedagogically. We're also trying to find someone that has a worked out process for inkjet printing of semiconductors, again, thin film transistors, uh, with both, both P and N transistors, one would hope. If we can find such a worked out process and raise the money to acquire the tools, which should be pretty cheap, we're looking at more like one day turnaround from design files to something you can test. That would change everything. Uh, we wouldn't have to have a summer program. We'd be able to offer adjunct classes for everything from the local high schools to the University of Wyoming. And that will be very interesting. So we'll see if we can pull this together. Uh, at any rate, Polysense is our tool for keeping the technology alive even if we're not commercially successful. And at this point, we've burned a little bit of the time that was supposed to be allocated, so why don't we just switch over to Daniel's video presentation and his Q&A, and then I will come back and we can talk about what Greener Aids is up to now. We could just let the jump start and give you a little extra time. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Let's just run. You guys are going to get to eat supper. That's a very desirable thing. Would you mind posting the URL so I can see Daniel's presentation too? I will. And I'll be posting that in the, in the, in the chat. Just one second. Post to sense the... Hi, my name is Daniel Kani, and in my presentation I'm going to show what would a green arrays chip reply if asked, can you speak USB? -ish? Almost everybody knows what USB is, universal serial bus. Although there are some people who believe it's a kind of vehicle, it's generally known as a means of connecting peripherals to computers. But how does USB work? As users, we usually don't need to know. However, my intention to implement a USB host in GA144 chip forced me to study USB in some detail. For those who are not acquainted with USB internals, I'll start this presentation with a 10-minute course on USB. A complete description of the bus is given in a USB specification. There is also a lot of literature on this subject. However, I consider as the best starting point a tutorial named USB Made Simple. The introduction to the USB that follows is an abbreviated version of this tutorial. USB is based on tier start topology. There is only one host, one or more hubs that provide forking of the bus, and a number of devices. Cables have four wires, two data lines, power and ground. There are several connector types nowadays, but here we are concerned with a type A plug which is found on such devices as mouse or keyboard. The communication is half duplex. Thus, only the host or one device can talk at a time. 
Communication uses differential signaling on D plus and D minus lines. USB device can also be powered from 5 volt bus, in which case a current limitation applies. Both D plus and D minus lines are pulled down at the host side with two 15K resistors. There are different data speeds, the original ones are shown in the table. A device communicates its data speed to the host with a pull-up resistor connected to either D plus or D minus line. The line can be present in either detached state, when no device is connected to the host, or attached state. When a low speed device is attached, D minus line goes high due to its pull-up resistor and the line is said to be idle. We can also talk of bus states. On two data lines, we can recognize four basic states, J, K, single-ended zero, and never used single-ended one state. The polarity of D plus and D minus lines in J and K states is shown for low-speed bus. It is reversed in full and high-speed buses. Another state is reset. The bus is said to be in reset state whenever there is a single-ended zero during more than 10 milliseconds. To end transmission of bits, host or device appends a single-ended zero for two bits time, followed by one bit of J state, and then let the bus go idle. This signal is called end of packet. When a low-speed host sends end of packet signal on an otherwise idle bus, we call it keep alive signal. This signal is used in order to prevent the device to enter suspended state which happens when line is idle for more than 3 milliseconds. Every device on the bus has an address. Address is 7 bits wide with range from 0 to 127. Address 0 is reserved for uninitialized devices only. Each device has one or more endpoints. There may be up to 16 endpoints per device. Endpoints are one-way ports sending data either to the host or receiving data from the host. Only endpoint 0 communicates in both directions and this endpoint is used for configuration of the device. Bytes are always transferred least significant bit first and for multibyte data least significant byte is transferred first. Data are encoded using non-written to zero inverted encoding scheme. Thus for zero bit polarity of data lines is changed, while for 1 bit there is no change in polarity. In order to avoid long periods of unchanged polarity when transferring a sequence of 1 bits, after 6 consecutive 1 bits there is an automatic insertion of a 0 bit. This is called bit stuffing. Packets are the smallest transmission elements. They are composed of integer number of bytes. Before and after a packet, the bus is held in the idle state. Every packet has the following structure. It starts with a sync pattern, which is made of alternating J and K states, except for the last two K states. Translated to bit value, sync is made of 7 zero bits, followed by a single one bit. Since data are transferred least significant bit first, sync pattern is actually 80 hex. As we've already seen, end of packet is made of two single-ended zero states and one J state. Between sync byte and end of packet, there are data bytes. The first byte is always packet identifier. As the name suggests, PID is used to identify type of the packet with its four least significant bits. Upper four bits are inversion of the lower bit as a fast error check. Let's have a look at the different packets. First we have a token packet. This packet is always the first packet in a transaction. It indicates device address, endpoint and purpose of transaction. In low speed USB we have in packet, out packet and setup packet. Then we have a data packet. It is used whenever we need to transfer some data. The payload may be 0 up to 8 bytes long. Error check is based on CRC16, which is appended to the payload. If more bytes need to be transferred, 
they have to be split in several data packets. Data packets are identified with either data0 or data1 PID. Finally, we use handshake packets. Those packets are used to confirm status of transaction. It's a simple means of providing handshake between host and device. Successful transactions are confirmed with an acknowledge packet, while transactions that cannot be finished, for instance due to the device being still busy, are handshaked with a negative acknowledge. Keep in mind that when there is an error in transfer data, no handshake is issued and as a consequence of timeout, the sending side tries to retransmit the data. Stall handshake informs the host that the device has encountered an error that it cannot repair on its own. One layer up, the USB communication is made of transactions. Transactions are sequences of three packets. They provide a secure transfer of data. We recognize three transaction types. Out transactions, where data is transferred from the host to a device. Alternating data 0 and data 1 packet identifiers are used to check for lost packets. In the out transaction, host sends token and data packets and expects to receive a handshake packet from the device. In transaction is similarly used for transfer of data from a device to the host. Again, data 0 and data 1 alternating PIDs are used. In this transaction, the host sends a token packet, device sends a data packet, and the host confirms with a handshake packet. Finally, we recognize a setup a transaction. It is similar to out transaction, but payload is always 8 bytes long, and only data 0 packet identifier is used. On the highest level, the USB protocol is made of different kinds of transfers. In low-speed USB, we use only two of them. Control transfer, used for initialization and configuration of a device, such as assigning its address and selecting the appropriate configuration. Communication takes always place with endpoint zero in both directions. The second transfer type available in low-speed USB is interrupt transfer. It uses in or out transactions, though in transaction is more common. The transfer is used for low throughput communication, often in regular intervals, such as in communication with a mouse or a keyboard. Finally, we need to mention a process called enumeration. When a device is attached to the bus for the first time, the host starts to request descriptors from the device. Descriptor is a data structure providing host with information about the particular device, such as the maximum data packet length. There are many different types of descriptors. When the host gathers the necessary information from descriptors, it assigns an address to the device configures the device as appropriate and can start data transfer as needed. There is a distinct type of devices called human interface devices. These devices can provide additional HID class descriptors, which among other things describe reports. This is in what format the device communicates data to the host. Apart from report protocol, some HIDs support also boot protocol, which is a much simplified version of reporting data. And as you can already guess, keyboards do support boot protocols, and boot protocol is also used in this project. After the short introduction into the USB, let's have a look at the project itself. The aim of the project was first to design and implement a low-speed USB host in GA144, then to implement a keyboard controller so that we could plug a USB keyboard into Greenery's eval board and use it to enter corrections. Finally, I will demonstrate usability of this controller in an Etherforce editor. Before we dive into details of the USB host implementation, we need to show how the specification has been simplified for this particular project. On the hardware side, we didn't employ any control of rise and fall times, and there's no root hub, nor support for hubs. 
This may seem strange, as without hubs only one device can be connected to the host. However, for this project we don't need to connect anything else than just one keyboard, so the simplification is acceptable. Regarding protocol, it has been proven that with only one device attached to the host, there's no need for assigning an address to the device, and zero address can be used all the time. Also, we never transfer more than 8 bytes of data in a single transaction. Thus, data 0 and data 1 toggling is not checked. We also disregard stall and shake. Finally, the keyboard controller does not provide for auto-repeat feature, and it also ignores simultaneously pressed keys except for shift key. Let's have a look now at hardware part of the project. Hardware is really simple. We just need a voltage level shifter since GA144 runs at 1.8 volts while USB signals are 3.3 volts. The best option seems to be 74LVC 2T45 chip. The resistor at the direction input is there because we control this input with an analog output pin of GA144 so we need a load resistor. Unfortunately, we could not use level shifter TXB0108 available on the EVA board that can switch direction automatically, nor its open collector version TXS0108. None of them worked well with USB pull-down and pull-up resistors. We also have a USB Type-A socket with two 15K pull-down resistors soldered directly on the EVA board. And that's all hardware we needed. The setup of this project then includes a USB keyboard, the voltage level shifter just shown, an ML board and a PC with Array Force IED. Now we start examining the software part of the project. First, let's see the floor plan. The USB host is implemented in 18 nodes of the host chip. The serial interface engine consists of 11 nodes, and the keyboard controller is made up of 7 nodes. The serial interface engine consists of a clock module, two transceiver nodes, a transmit path and a receive path. The keyboard controller consists of a module with description of packets and transactions, the controller itself and a character decoder. For the purpose of demo application, we also have a link that allows communication between the USB host and Array 4 IED. One important note about data and commands. As was recently discussed on SVFIC forum, it has become a de facto standard to treat data in multiples of 8 bits. Thus, we usually have 8, 16, 32 and even 64 bit words. One advantage of GA144 chip is its unconventional 18-bit word. In such a word, we can have, for instance, 16-bit data write justified. This gives us two extra bits that can be used as a kind of supplementary information embedded in data or simply a flag. We can have a stream of bytes or 16-bit words with top two bits cleared. This would be our data. However, when bit 17 is set, we know the information in the lower 16 bits is not data, but something else. For instance, an address of code to be executed. We can jump to this address with push return instructions, or we can call this address with push x instructions, because only low 10 bits are placed into the instruction pointer and the rest is ignored. This feature is widely used in our code. So whenever we say data, we mean a word with its most significant bit low, and when we say command or message, we mean a word with its most significant bit high. Now we'll see how the USB host is implemented. We'll start with a serial interface engine. First, there's a clock module. It's composed of three nodes, an oscillator, with 12 MHz ceramic resonator on its GPIO pin. The oscillator provides a double frequency signal to node 317 with a period of 42 nanoseconds. At load speed rate, it represents 16 clock periods per bit. Then we have a wire node passing this signal to a timer that provides millisecond pulses to node 216. 
Next, we'll have a look at transceivers. Transceivers are implemented in nodes 317 and 217. Their GPIO pins are connected to D plus and D minus lines. They receive 24 MHz clock to up port of node 317. The node itself is controlled via its down port. When transmitting, node 217 is controlled via its right port, while when receiving, it's controlled via its up port. Both GPIO pins are initialized in weak pull-down mode. The pin in node 217 is also used to detect low-speed device attachment. Based on desired activity, we have to switch direction of the voltage level shifter. To this end, we use node 117 and its analog output pin. When we want to get data from a device, we call word in to set direction line low, and when we send data to a device, we call word out, which sets direction line high. Let's see how transceivers work in transmit mode. There's word bit in node 317. This word contains 4 micronex loop that fetches 16 times from up port. This takes 16 clock periods, which is length of 1 bit. Then we jump back to down port. Next, we have two words controlling state of D plus line. Plus J sets the line low, while plus K sets it high. Notice that both words end with call to bit, which separates two consecutive calls by exactly one bit time. This creates the basic transmit timing mechanism. In note 217, there are similar words J and K. Executing J, we first call plus J in node 317, which sets D plus line low, and at the same time we set D minus line high. Then we set out direction of the bus. Word K works in a similar way, as well as word single ended zero. Finally, we have word idle, which calls idle in node 317, and both set GPIO pins in weak pull-down mode. Then we set in direction of the bus. Here we have an example of waveform generated by the transmitter. We can see a start of frame signal, 1-bit K state, 1-bit J state, and end of packet signal composed of two single-ended zero states followed by one J state. At the end of J state we can distinguish beginning of idle state. Now we'll turn our attention to transmit path. Transmit path is composed of three nodes, serializer and CRC calculator, bit stuffing and encoder. The path receives a stream of bytes via write port of node 115, and outputs corresponding J and K states via write port of node 216. Commands that control the transmit path are intertwined in the data stream. We'll follow the transmit path from the encoder backwards. Encoder node receives a stream of bits and converts it into J and K states by calling appropriate code in transceiver node 217. The code for encoder is given here. Definitions begin with a variable state, which holds value of the last transmitted state, 0 for j and 1 for k. The execution starts in word transmit. It is an endless loop where we fetch a word from up port, and if the word is a command, we call the appropriate code with push x instructions. Upon returning from called word, we jump back to transmit. If the fetched word is data, we call the word encode to convert the bit into appropriate state and then jump back to transmit. Word encode compares the bit on stack with the value stored in variable state and calls either k or j in node 217. In either case, we store the transmitted state in the variable state. Other words in this node are commands. We have the end of packet command, keep alive command, which waits for a signal from one millisecond timer in node 316, and then sends the end of packet. Command start of frame, 
is called right before a new transaction begins. It is similar to keep alive command, but it also tests if the device is still attached. A command executed for a newly attached device is reset. It generates a reset state of the bus. We also have rx command, which hands over the control of transceivers to node 117 when we want to receive packet from the device. This stuffing is carried out in node 116. It passes all data and commands from left port to up port. Bit stuffing algorithm is simple. Let's say that this is a stream of bits passing through the node. When it encounters six consecutive one bits, it just inserts a zero bit into the stream. The first node in transmit path is serializer and CRC calculator. It performs several simple functions. It serializes all data bytes, least significant bit first. It calculates CRC for all data bytes and it passes all commands except for two intended for this node. One is clearing CRC register and the other sends 16 bit of CRC out for transmission. We'll have a look at transceivers again, but now we'll see how they work in receive mode. The most challenging problem in receive mode is how to synchronize receiver's clock to incoming data. A solution to this problem is a self-synchronizing clock. The algorithm is first explained graphically. Assume this is a time axis with marked 16T intervals. This would be a signal on D plus line. The arrow indicates that we start from idle state. The algorithm starts waiting for a rising edge. When it arrives, we start counting 8T interval to get to the midpoint of this bit. Here we read state of D plus line. From now on, we start counting at most 16T interval, while at the same time we look for a falling edge of the signal. When the edge arrives, we stop counting and start 8T interval again. At its end, we detect and record state of the line. The algorithm repeats. We count at most 16T while waiting for an edge and so on. A different situation arises when there is no edge detected within 16T interval. In that case, we read state of T plus line at the end of the interval and start a new 16T interval waiting for an edge. So the algorithm can be described in several steps. Detect an edge at the beginning of a packet. It is presumably the first edge of sync pattern. Count 8T interval and read state of D plus line. Count up to 16T while waiting for an edge and, if detected, stop counting and go to step 2. Else, if edge not detected within 16T interval, read state of D plus line and go to step 3. Thus the clock is resynchronized at each edge and due to bit stuffing, we resynchronize at most after 6 bits. Now we'll see code of the self-synchronizing clock. First, we'll examine code in node 317. Here we have word fetch bit, which waits for 8t, then reads state of D plus line and jumps to down port. Notice that the state of line is not sent anywhere. It stays on the node's stack. However, we can get this value by reading stack content with code executed in down port. Thus, wherever word fetch bit is used, the execution stops and continues after node 217 sends store to p return instruction word to down port. This code sends top stack item of node 317 to node 217 and execution resumes where word fetch bit has been called. Next word is edge. This word is essentially for next loop. In each cycle we wait for 1t and then read state of d plus line. If the line is high, we've detected a rising edge of sync pattern, so we discard the loop index and return. The loop runs for at most 17 bits time. If no edge is detected within that time, we leave a zero flag on stack to signalize timeout and go to down port. Word sync first calls edge. We now see that if the edge on D plus line hasn't been detected, we jump to down port and never return back to word sync. However, if edge has been detected, we return here and execute fetch bit. 
which leaves non-zero value on stack. After node 217 reads the flag, we continue from sync by falling through to ward is j. Is j is a for next loop of 16 cycles. In each cycle we wait for one t and read state of d plus line. Then we test if the line is low. If so, we've detected an edge of j state, so we wait for 8t interval in fetch bit, read d plus line state and leave it on stack. When read by node 217, we jump to what is k. If no edge is detected within 16t time, we jump to down port, so that node 217 can read the last state of d plus line left on stack by fetch b instruction and finally we jump back to what is j because we still wait for j state and its leading edge. What is k works in the same fashion. Both is j and is k are the heart of the self-synchronizing clock algorithm. As long as node 217 reads d plus line state values from stack, the algorithm is running between these two words. Since for each bit we jump to down port, we give node 217 control of this algorithm and an opportunity to stop it by jumping to any other word in a node 317. Code for receive mode in node 217 starts when node 216 calls word hand that informs node 117 that we will receive a packet from a device and hands over its control by jumping to up port. Word read is the one that sends instruction word store to p return to node 317 to get its top stack item and leave it on stack here. The main code for receive mode is in words next and input. Word input first calls sync in node 317 and reads a flag. If it is non-zero, we've detected an edge so we send this information downstream and keep the state of d plus line here on stack. Then we read state of d minus line and send state of both lines to node 117 for further processing. We finish word input by jumping to up port. If on the other hand the flag from calling sync is a zero, we send it downstream as an error flag and then jump to write port because this is the end of receiving data from a device and we are getting ready to transmit again. Word next reads d plus line state from node 317 and jumps ahead in order to read d minus line state and send both values downstream. It then also jumps to up port waiting for further instructions from node 117. This picture demonstrates where individual bits have been detected. We can see some variations, but on average state of a line is always detected in the vicinity of a bit center. Thus, the algorithm works as expected. Now we'll go quickly through the receive path. It is composed of decoder, bit stripping node, and deserializer and CRC calculator. Receive path starts reception of a packet and checks for possible timeout. It then receives a stream of D plus and D minus line states and outputs decoded bytes. It also informs controller about the device being attached or detached. And as already mentioned, it switches direction of voltage level shifter. Let's have a look at the decoder's code. Here we have a variable D minus holding the last state of D minus line. Then we need a word that converts D minus line state into bit value. In this word, we compare current D minus line state with the variable D minus. If changed, the bit is zero, else it's one. We use number 80 hex for one bit because serial data are received least significant bit first, but this serializer assembles bytes using write shifts. So we have to start from bit seven. The main word for receiving packets is Rx, which is called when we expect a packet from the device. It initializes variable D- minus to idle state of D- minus line, and then it calls word input in node 217 and fetches back a flag. If non-zero, we have a sync recognized, and we jump to word receive. Here we receive a pair of D- minus and D- plus line states. For each pair fetched, we test end of packet signal, which is recognized as both lines being low. If it's not end of packet, we call word bit, send the decoded bit downstream, 
update variable d minus and call word next in node 217 to read the next bit. Then we jump back to the beginning of word receive. Thus we receive and decode all bits until we get end of packet signal which is reported downstream and execution continues toward dx which does some housekeeping and returns control of node 216 to transmit path. Then we jump back to up port. In case there is a timeout reported from node 216, we pass that error to a controller and jump to up port. Bit stripping works in the same way as bit stuffing. After six consecutive one bits, the following bit, presumably zero, is removed from the stream. The serializer converts serial bit stream into bytes. It starts CRC calculation for data packets and checks CRC when whole data packet is received. Handshake packets and messages are passed without CRC calculation. And that's all what makes a serial interface engine. We have seen how bytes and commands are sent through the engine to a device, how the engine controls all the traffic over the bus, and how replies from the device are converted back to bytes and messages. We've also seen the delicate interplay of transceiver nodes with encoder and decoder nodes. We've seen how they pass data and control from one to the other, how they execute each other's code with port execution mechanism and so on. An important point is that this serial interface engine can be used to communicate with any low-speed USB device with no modification whatsoever. We use it here to control a USB keyboard, but we could as well use it for mouse or a joystick. The difference is made by packets sent to the particular device and received back from the device. And those are assembled and analyzed by a controller that is specific for each kind of device. Thus, to control a keyboard, we need a keyboard controller. And this will be presented now. Since keyboard controller code is less general, in the following I'll show only the most important features. First, we'll see how packets and transactions are predefined. All packets we need are stored in node 215 in a compact form. There's only data, no code. Each packet starts with length of record and other words contain bytes, pairs of bytes, 16-bit numbers or commands making up the packet. For instance, setup packet is composed of a sync byte, setup PID, a word with address 0, endpoint 0 and CRC5 checksum. The last word is a command for node 214 to execute word stop. Note 214 is responsible for extracting individual bytes from compressed packets. There are also definitions of commands, which are sequences of actions that are used in multiple packets. When we encounter a command in a packet description, we call its address with push x instructions. In case of setup packet, we execute word stop, which contains a command for serializer and CRC calculator in a node 115 to execute from its right port. Then we send a call to word clear, which clears CRC calculator. And finally, we send a command to encoder in a node 216 to generate end of packet. Another example is conf data packet. It is sent to a device to set configuration. It is composed of a sync byte, data PID, a command to clear CRC calculator, then there are 8 bytes of payload, and finally a command CRC fetch. This is again a word in node 214, which requests the CRC calculator to send 16 CRC bits out. Then there's a command for encoder to generate end of packet and finally we execute another command in encoder word rx which sets transceivers into receive mode because we expect a handshake packet from the device. Node 114 combines different packets into transactions. For instance, the set configuration transaction we've just seen is defined as two packets named setup and conf that are compiled in node 214 at those addresses. Thus, calling word set configuration in this node carries out all actions related to this transaction. We define here also several simple actions such as reset command for encoder node 216. In the very heart of this module, there are two controller nodes. 
During initialization, node 15 is a master and node 14 functions as a wire between node 15 and node 114. Code in this node defines a sequence of transactions taking place during initialization of a new attached keyboard. We start by calling word reset we've seen in node 114. Then we configure the keyboard. The first transaction sets keyboard's configuration. Word request calls word set configuration in node 114 and word status waits for a handshake packet to check if the transaction has been successful. If not, the request is repeated. If acknowledge is successful, we continue with the next request. After last configuration request, which turns on the caps lock LED, calling word keys in node 14 transfers control to this node and node 15 jumps to right port and becomes a slave. The main task of node 14 is to request and process reports. Most of code is dedicated to that task. We'll just look at word keys, which is an endless loop. It repeatedly calls word wait in node 114, which sends 50 keep alive signals. Therefore, we wait for 50 milliseconds, and then we issue an in transaction from endpoint 1. This is the endpoint that sends a report on currently pressed keys. Then we call word report to process received data bytes. Report is an 8-byte data structure shown here, where modifier keys are encoded as a bit array. Note 14 ignores all reports except for those with only one key code reported, so we ignore multiple keys pressed at the same time. We also process only shift modifier keys. Only those two bytes are sent out for character decoding. This takes place in character decoder module. The decoder occupies node 13 and 12. It receives key codes and sends them out converted according to chosen character set. A part of key codes provided by a USB keyboard is shown here. For the purpose of demo applications, we've chosen to convert key codes into ether fourth character set. To this end, we use two methods. First, we subtract a constant from key code to remove error codes. Then, we can identify a block of letters that can be converted to etherforce corrections by adding a constant. There are also two other blocks, non-printable corrections and function keys, which can be processed in the same way. Finally, we ignore non-alphanumeric corrections not present in the etherforce corrections set. What rests is a small set that we can store in a hash table. The table looks like this. Each word in the table contains a key code in the low 6 bits, which is used as an index. Non-shifted and shifted characters are then stored in middle and top 6 bits respectively. Function keys and non-printable characters have no code in Etherforce character set. They can be encoded either as messages with bit 17 set, or they can be converted into call instructions that we can send directly to a target node for port execution. And now is the right time to demonstrate how the USB host and keyboard controller work. In this demo I'll show how a keyboard can be attached to and detached from the eval board and how keys are processed. We will use the ArrayForce IDE to inspect stack content of node 11. This node receives characters from the keyboard controller and places them on its stack. When I plug the keyboard into the USB socket on the eval board, you may see all keyboard LEDs blink, which indicates that the keyboard has been reset. And now only caps lock LED is on, which is indication that the keyboard has been initialized properly and is ready. When I start typing, you can see Etherforce character codes appear on stack. First, typing letters from A to H, then numerals from 0 to 5. Now, if I detach the keyboard and attach it again, the controller detects the keyboard, resets it, and configures as indicated by caps lock LED being on. I can now continue typing as before several more letters and numerals. When I press keys with non-printable characters, for instance space, enter and escape, you can see call instructions instead of character code. 
function keys are encoded as messages with bit 17 set, with the low bits corresponding to the number of the function key, f1, f2, f3. It demonstrates that the host takes care of this newly attached keyboard, and Node 11 does not need to be aware of what has happened. We just shows characters as they are received. In the next the demonstration, I'll show the current state of Etherforce. Eight years ago, Chuck Moore presented his character-oriented display generated by Evalboard, which was part of the Etherforce system. At that time, I hadn't had any experience with Greenery's chips yet, but his presentation may have been the spark that ignited my interest in those chips. Two years later, I started my collaboration with Green Arrays, and then I became also interested in Etherforce. When Chuck's website, colorforce.com, was still running, there was some information about Etherforce in his eval weblog. The site is not on anymore, but the content is archived on GitHub. As it seemed that Chuck had put aside Etherforce development, I asked him if he would share the code with me, and I'm very grateful he agreed. So the work you'll see in a few moments is kind of continuation of Chuck's original development environment. So what is Etherforce? From the Chuck's eval weblog, we learned that Etherforce is a variant of Colorforce that resides on Green Array's multi-computer chips. The Ether is then a term for software in every computer's RAM that routes messages about the chip. It is actually similar to Green Array's Ganglia. As with Colorforce, Tags are used to identify pre-parsed words in source code. In contrast to classic Colorforce channel coded characters, Etherforce uses 6-bit characters preceded by a 6-bit tag. It also uses 6-bit tokens to indicate F18 instructions. There are already some modifications made to tags and tokens assignments, so this table is slightly different from the original. The table shows that tags have two most significant bits set high. Tags define in what color the following word should be displayed. Some tags, such as space and end of block, have no color. Tags also define how to interpret the following characters. They may represent, for instance, a decimal number or a word. Color then indicates whether such a number or word should be interpreted or compiled in the same way as in Colorforce. The first two tags signalize tokens. Tokens are 6-bit characters that are displayed as character strings. First 32 tokens are reserved for F18 instructions. Then there are 16 other tokens for names of ports, registers or program flow control words. To make the encoding scheme clear, I'll show a short example. These are two lines of source code that would appear on display. Now we'll show a part of display buffer, where each rectangle represents one 18-bit word, which is divided into three 6-bit characters. The text on display is gray, and we apply corresponding colors as we fill the buffer with tags and characters. We start with red word move. The first item in memory is 35 hex, the tag for red words. Then four letters of the word move follow. Then we add a green decimal number 7. Again, we have a tag and character added to the buffer. Now we enter several F18 instructions, which are stored as tokens. The entry starts with 31 hex, a tag for green tokens, then follows one token per character. By now, you could have noticed that each tag is displayed as a space in front of the word that follows. However, when we print tokens, there is a space in front of each of them. The line ends with end of line tag. When display code recognizes this tag, it prints a space, as for any other tag, and then adds a blue comma so that I can see where the line ends. We move to the next source line on the display, but we simply continue filling the display buffer, now with a red word go. We add a hexadecimal number 20, and three tokens follow. Notice that word left is not an F18 instruction, but it is convenient to have it as a token too, so it occupies only one 6-bit character in the buffer. 
Although green word move has the same color as preceding F18 instructions, we have to encode it with its alt tag as a string of green characters. And since semicolon represents return instruction, it has to be encoded as a green token. Finally, we add the end of line tag and if this is the last line in the display buffer, there's always an end of block tag. In the two lines of source we have 51 characters, including spaces between words. To store this text in the display buffer, we used only 11 words, this is 33 6-bit characters. This shows that the encoding scheme designed by Chuck is really very space efficient. Back to Etherforce. It was supposed to become a standalone operating system that boots from Flash. It would expect external RAM memory, an RGB video monitor and 4 key keypad. Now the keypad is the only thing that I didn't really like and that was the real motivation to develop the USB host and keyboard controller. Other than that, Etherforce is still a system I'm very enthusiastic about. So how Etherforce looks like today? This is the current floor plan of Etherforce. In this part is Chuck's display code with some minor modifications. It renders one block of source code on a DGA screen. Its resolution is 24 lines of 50 characters each. Here we have a SRAM controller with an arrow indicating how source blocks are loaded into SRAM from a PC with the help of Ether. In the future it will be loaded from either onboard flash memory or from an MMC card. Here is the USB host and keyboard controller and this part generates horizontal and vertical sync signals as well as character clock which is fed into node 715 internally so we don't need any external wire. It uses the USB oscillator as its clock source. And the last part is an editor which I am going to show in action now. First, we load Etherforce code from PC. This intro screen shows the system is running and now the first source block is displayed. The editor has two modes. First is navigation, which allows to move between blocks, move cursor by lines down, and up and to move by words right and left. The editor uses the same keys for navigation as Colorforth. The second editor mode is used when we want to type a text. It is invoked by one of 12 function keys. Each key represents one tag so that when we enter the typing mode we also choose what color the text will have. Let's move to the next block and add some new definitions right below this line with comment. The definition starts with function key F8, which starts red words. When we type the name, we switch to green decimals with F2, enter the number 7 and switch to green tokens with F6. Now, typing tokens requires some training as each token is entered as a single key press. The current keyboard layout, including tokens, is shown here. Entering F18 instructions this way is kind of similar to entering basic keywords in some home 8-bit computers, for example Sinclair ZX Spectrum. The end of line is simply generated with Enter key. Then we can continue the next line. Again, we switch to red words, type a name, then key F4 turns green hex numbers on, F6 turns back to green tokens, then we use F9 to turn to green words, so we can type word move. If we make a mistake while still entering characters, we can use backspace key to correct the word just being typed. To add this word and move the cursor forward, we either change color with the function key, or we use spacebar if we want to continue entering words of the same color. Finally, we enter semicolon as a green token. And that's all. End of block is always present at the end of source block, so we don't need to enter it explicitly. To leave the typing mode, we just hit escape key. The editor also allows entering spaces similar to blue dots in color 4. 
These are entered with the tab key. The changes made to the source are automatically stored in SRAM during typing, so that when we leave the typing mode and move to another block and back, the changes we've made remain. Since the editor is still being developed, some functions, such as deleting whole words or copying words and inserting them elsewhere, are still waiting to be implemented, as well as other parts of Etherforce, such as some minimal interpreter and, of course, compiler. And we are almost at the end of my presentation. By now, you should know the answer to the question asked at the beginning. Hopefully, it has been sufficiently demonstrated that Greenery's chips can speak usb -ish, even though slowly and with only one interlocutor at a time. I wish to thank Greenery's, namely Greg Bailey, for his support and friendship, and Chuck Moore for giving me his Etherforce source. I'd like to also acknowledge MQP Electronics, a UK-based company which owns rights to the tutorial USB Made Simple and which allowed me to use it in this presentation. Thank you for listening.
<laughs> I want the ink formulas. I want a source of the ink. I want a printer that works. It doesn't have to be recalibrated once a day, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's that's the goal. So if you if you don't mind firing what you found over, that would be appreciated. Yeah, I have a large collection of PDFs on that topic, and uh, yeah, I don't know what the latest is right now. Um, they got the feature size down, but uh, it would be nice to have a tool where I can just uh, export to a like, postscript or something, and then send it to the printer and have the inks and import the different materials and the uh, four cartridges or something like that. Um, not that far along, though, but I, yeah. Okay, the British company is called Pragmatic Printing Inc. You'll find nice comments. Yeah, you'll find nice comments about them in this textbook here. And um, the only serious deficiency with their process right now is that they don't know how to make them. Well, anybody knows how to make them, but they're looking for material that isn't going to require a dramatic change in their process. Um, also, they will. Their, their goal as a company is to sell you a shipping container which contains a functional fab. It is not totally cheap, but the yeah. goal is to sell the equipment to make this stuff with. Huh. It's outside our budget, but might not be outside yours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then just one last thing. Uh, I am interested in the uh, PolySans uh, um, course. Uh, I was curious about it. Uh, is that... Um, has that been started yet, or is that in the works, or uh, curious about it? Well, to begin with, we really have to get through the 501c3 process before we can talk seriously about it, because we need to raise funds to do it. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, um, we have communicated with Lynn Conway, who was the co-author of the very first book on BLSI design that either Chuck or I read. And uh, she actually taught the first course in this subject at MIT. Lynn has indicated that she's willing to let us um, make use of her course materials and her outlines, which is a good start. Yeah. Also, uh, one of the students in her class at MIT was Marty Freeman. He also ran some classes and this type of stuff later on, and he has volunteered to send some of his materials as well. So we're getting a little bit of support from other people that have done this without without an, an A in your curriculum behind it, too. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Sure enough. Oh, and, and incidentally, the domain is polysats, P-O-L-Y-S-A-N-C-E dot org. There is no website there yet because we're still working on the, on the graphics. Um, the, the name is a mashup of polymath and renaissance, of course. Spot, speak to that general direction because you want both mics. Um, hi, good afternoon, Greg. Um, I'm Ken Boak. I'm a hardware engineer, normally based in the UK, but I'm over here in California for fourth day. Um, there's an interesting development in, uh, in the UK by a company that's come up with a, a new bipolar Zener process. Um, I, I'm, concerned, uh, I'm aware of your concerns about MOSIS, and um, you might uh, have a look in there direction. Uh, you can search for it on Google. Um, it is called Bi Zen, so that's a concatenation of bipolar Zener. And they're offering a very, uh, well, a relatively low cost, very fast turnaround uh, because it fundamentally reduces the number of masks that you need. So they're talking about two week turnaround from tape out to um, silicon in your in your hand. Now, Thank you. it might not be totally relevant, but uh, please check that. Appreciate it. Thank you. These are supposed to be questions for Daniel. I have, I, I, have a, I have a question for Daniel. Um, on the, the, uh, the sample, um, I noticed there was a color difference um, between the 7 in the, uh, the, the upper loop and the uh, 20 in the lower uh, uh, the, the, in the lower uh, go word. I was curious what the what the significance of that was, why one showed up in, in bright green and one showed up in dark green. Yeah, okay, good afternoon everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the, the light green, when, when numbers are concerned, the light
light green is a, a number in decimal, but the dark green is number in hex. And similarly, when you have yellow numbers, yellow is decimal and brown is in hex. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how's the uh, video working on your end? Has this been successful in terms of uh, about the communication? Uh, <laughs> uh, how, sorry. Uh, how, how has the, the video been from you guys' end? Is this a workable uh, pattern going forward? And I'm curious to the audience as well if there's yeah. feedback. We'll have to ask the folks that are watching online whether it makes sense later. Any other questions? Well, why don't we get me going then to try and occupy the next 30 minutes? All right. Yeah. Hello again. I'm going to switch over to the graphic for the moment. And uh, let's just see how it goes, see if we have time for some Q&A afterwards. Okay. All righty. We have been busy for the last year. Um, right after fourth day, Mark Schmader came out for his annual pilgrimage to the snow slopes, and along with him came Michael Schultz, whom you might remember as having accompanied um, Mangpo in her presentations some years ago. And Michael has expressed interest in working with us, um, as 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 well as Green Arrays itself, as with Polysons, and so. Michael spent some time here in December and January coming up to speed with our tools and capabilities. And uh, He is potentially new blood for us. Um, we first got to seduce him away from the pot industry, but if we're funded, we ought to be able to do that. And, of course, we made polysense, already discussed that, and then had some fun uh, because Stefan had been trying to get me to come to Switzerland for years, and so we went to his disgusting part of the country, Grenken is his town, and that's how terrible it looks there, and had the great pleasure of spending some time with both Stefan and Daniel and both of their families, and that was very nice. At the time that that was going on, the eval board number two had been manufactured and was on its way into people's hands. Um, for those that haven't looked at what we've done with the eval board, um, we made some changes to make it more practical to use as a full-up development system in its own right. Uh, the SPI flash is now large enough to have a whole bunch of code and or data in it. It's also the largest we can make it without escaping the 24-bit addressing, which is uh, intrinsic to the, to the ROM code that we have. Uh, there were a few little errors in the eval board one. Um, due to an oversight, we had laid out the board such, with, such that we needed to put very large expensive capacitors in the power regulator. We'd also managed to reverse rotate, actually, by 180 degrees the whole pattern for the VGA connector. Um, and the activity LEDs on the FTDI USB devices had been inserted on the assumption that we were capable of pushing them in the direction we weren't capable of pushing them in from that uh, from the FTDI chip. So we fixed that stuff. Also, uh, largely due to Daniel's experience and recommendation, we replaced half of the level shifters with single-ended ones. It's still not an absolute solution to the problem, but uh, it's, it gives you more flexibility. So there are three of each now. We added a watchdog and reset chip, which has proven to be useful for some applications. But it's not, it's not mandatory to be used. It's just that there's a place to hook it up. Um, we took the 10 base C interface electronics, which were previously on a separate daughter board, and actually laid them out on the eval board, too. The board is designed to be able to also accommodate the piggyback if there's some reason someone wants to use that. And the crystal in question is the 10 megahertz crystal that we must use for transmit the uh, the ceramic resonators are not accurate enough for the receivers on most Ethernet devices. They're very uptight about that. 
Uh, we don't use the crystal at all on a received side. We are very unuptight about that, but that's the way it goes. Uh, there's also a dual op amp there to jack up the drive to the required power for the long Ethernet cables. And there's a standard magnetics a transformer and filter. And the result is that the Eval Board 2 may be used as its own development system with external terminal or later with Telnet. Here's the original Eval Board 1, which we've all seen many times. And the Eval Board 2 is just a little different looking. You can see the Ethernet interface in the front there. Those jumpers between it and the host chip area are the ones that connect it to the host chip, otherwise it's not in use. Power can be removed from it easily by just removing that yellow jumper that takes five volts across from the power regulator. And there we are. And also, as, as is our want, we try and buck the tide of people not documenting things by producing a rather exhaustive manual on the board. So that product is now being shipped to customers, and we're happily enjoying ourselves with that. It's being produced by someone in Denver area, which is excellent so that we can uh, supervise that. The next major project that we've engaged in has been to implement and release Array 4.3, uh, which is basically a development environment that exists on two computers. Uh, the host computer, if you need one, is any old x86, and the target computer is, well, in this case, a Valvoid 2, which can also do its own development from source with no problem at all. Um, there are a bunch of, there's a bunch of code that we had to convert from Colorforth to uh, a form that's recognizable in ASCII. And uh, we did that and we reproduced all of the object code perfectly. Um, there were many functions that were also adapted, including the automated testing of chips. And we made a new soft sim. So this system basically provides pretty much the same capabilities, either in a tethered host programming environment or an on-the-board environment, except those cases where it doesn't make any sense. For example, the soft sim down at the bottom of this table uh, is only supported by Saneforth on the x86 because the resources to do that with on the chip are not sufficient, uh, including both time and space. Um, on the other hand, there are things that can only be on the target chip, such as internal development environment, internal IDE, uh, which is vastly faster than the serial one that comes over the, uh, over the synchronous serial communication at a megabit. This is something that will speak out of the snorkel and ganglion mechanism at much higher speeds. Likewise, um, internal bootstream delivery is irrelevant on the PC. And so this, these two environments work together. And they are compatible in the sense that they work off the same source base. They work off the same source code in terms of F18 code. And it's pretty seamless. The new ID, excuse me, the new soft sim environment um, simulates two chips rather than one and is a bit more accessible in terms of adding test beds and adding mechanism to the I.O. Um, and it's pretty fast. And as usual, we violate the conventional rules by documenting our work. And so here is the user's manual for Array 4.3. So there are some pieces of this that have yet to be developed, but there is a sufficient critical mass there that there's no need to use Color 4 if you don't want to. And after all of that effort was more or less complete, we were finally able to sit down and get serious about demonstrating a completely software-defined GPS receiver. Motivation for this is that we have a customer who wishes to minimize overall energy per fix. Uh, you can sit there and you can buy a chip that um, does the correlation, and by the time you're all done and you count up the amount of pads that you have to charge up and discharge in order to communicate between things or add a USB interface or any of the other garbage which is often there, you discover that the energy efficiency of that chip is pretty much minimized by the amount of 
communication overhead that it has to speak to somebody else. Bear in mind that the cost is VDD squared over uh, times two, excuse me, VDD squared C over two is the amount of energy in joules that it takes to charge or discharge a trace on a PC board. So the less of those that you have to charge or discharge, the less energy you waste charging and discharging them. Anyway, this customer's goal was to have a device that could run for a long time, and it had numerous other tasks besides being a GPS receiver. Um, so the goal here is to embed the GPS receiver to the extent possible inside the chip, which is also doing all of the other stuff, and overall end up with less less of a budget to get the job done. We started work on this way back in June of 2013 when the person behind this project uh, persuaded Chuck and me to work on the demonstration of what kind of energy we would need to have a basic GPS signal correlator. So we did about seven days worth of work back then to prove that it was feasible. After which we had to wait for a very long time before we were supplied by this customer with a, uh, a foundation, a mechanism for verifying that we were getting the correct answers from correct source data. Uh, this was basically a software-defined GPS receiver for x86s that uses 100 watts or more. Um, but which is available on SourceForge and is public domain code and has got the GPL license on it and everything else, along with some test data. And by December 2018, they were supplying us, uh, including Michael Schult, with a foundation, a, a, a level of that code and a level of an example incoming data file, which could produce a known set of results. And that's fine, because that allowed us to pursue whether we were screwing anything up, and it's been very useful. So we had that in hand as of last January 2019. However, by then, it turned out that all of the RF front end chips that everyone had used for this type of thing in the past were basically out of production. There are a number of GPS front end chips you can get, but there are only a couple of them that have been made that give you the bare minimum that you need, specifically an ADC on the IF that gives you 2-bit data. A lot of them still exist, which have a whole bunch of additional stuff in them to give you some kind of results over, G over a USB connection and everything. But that's not what we need in order to do this. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to perhaps embed onto a chip all of the RF front end and IF and eliminate yet more pins that don't have to be charged and discharged to make the whole thing work. So that's the model that we we're after. And finally, by June of 2019, we identified a chip that was just going into production that we could get documentation for, which was a, a saga in its own right. However, now we have a supply of suitable, two different suitable RF front end chips, and we do have documentation on both, and that's great. So last July and also last September were basically intensive efforts on making a software-defined GPS receiver. It's an interesting problem, and the reason it's an interesting problem is that, as Chuck points out, it in many ways resembles radio astronomy. Consider that all 32 GPS satellites are transmitting on the same frequency, plus or minus the whatever variation they have in their frequency references. Uh, and also, as we noticed down at the bottom of this, uh, including also Doppler shift. Handling. But basically, all these signals are all just cacophonously blasting away on the same frequency. And quite often, you can see somewhere between 10 and 16 of these satellites. So there's a lot of, a lot of signal generators blathering at the same frequency. Each of these signals has amplitude modulated with a pseudo-random number that is satellite dependent so that you can identify the satellite by the random number at exactly 1.023 megahertz plus or minus Doppler shift. So you get a full pseudo random number every millisecond. On top of that signal, there is digital data which is encoded at 50 whole baud by inverting or not uh, two 20 consecutive pseudo random numbers. 
So you basically get 20 consecutive PRNs in the same polarity and you say, well, I've got the right one. I, I know that this is a one or a zero. Okay. So 37,500 bits or 12 and a half minutes later, you've also received the complete digital message coming out over the GPS network. And in addition, of course, there's Doppler shift, ionospheric variation, and stuff um, flagellating these signals around. So the problem is, how do you how do you pull one of these out of the mud? Well, the method that we were shown works to pull the stuff out of the mud is that you take no more than two bit samples at about five megahertz from the IF. This is real data, not quadrature data. And why have more than two-bit data when there's, when there's that much noise? As Chuck pointed out again, this is, sounds just like radio astronomy. So basically, for a given satellite, we then compute in some four correlations of these data. And of course, we need a tool, an instrument for computing these correlations for each of the satellites that we're trying to track or acquire at the moment. So we end up with a whole bunch of nodes sitting there being correlators. And basically one data sample, normally per 200 nanoseconds or so, goes charging down this pipeline of correlators. And every millisecond we talk to the correlators, we give them new phase angle increments for tiny frequency shifts or by trying to shift phase. And we receive correlation sums from all of them, which is 48 numbers in the case of 16. We're shooting 12 correlators. And we also have to run control loops around all of this for acquiring and tracking satellites. We're basically looking at the correlations and then changing the phase angle increments to try and change the frequencies a little bit or to step ahead and increment and, and change the phase. There's another little argument that goes in there for changing the phase by a half of a bit time. All these low-level control loops are, are doing all of this again every millisecond. We have to be able to configure the correlators for new satellites. And all of this is important for timing in the sense that we cannot drop any of the incoming samples. So we have had to build a fairly remarkable FIFO-like apparatus on the incoming side of this so that while we are updating phase angle increments in the correlators and while we're retrieving results, we are not losing data. The current model for all of this then has all of the time critical parts implemented in F-18 nodes, of which a whole bunch of F-18 nodes are busy doing this work. Uh, the high level functions which are not time critical on a one millisecond cycle or a 200 nanosecond data sample are done in high level polyforth on the same chip because, in fact, the current design puts the entire receiver and everything else that this application is doing on a single G144. We are going to shortly be building the little PC boards with the RF chip on them, and this is the little tool which sits on the bench and allows you to mess up a PCB design two or three or four times a day. And that's probably likely because certainly I've never designed an RF circuit board before, and so I'm pretty sure I will screw something up at least once or twice before we have something that works. But the goal is that we will actually be listening to real GPS data coming down from a, an antenna outdoors and shoving it through all of this wonderful algorithmic stuff. And that's about it for the... GPS receiver. We're not releasing the code at this time because this customer would like to have an exclusive right to build GPS receivers using our chips. And we're waiting to find out if that customer is going to fund us as generously as they've said they will. If they do, then it will be a condition of sale for J144 chips that you may use them for anything except all the things that the fab requires us to exclude, like making nuclear weapons. And also, you will not make GPS receivers out of them, and such is life. Now, additionally, during this year, we're still working on the GLOW, um, which, is, which is our next generation internal CAD system. 
Uh, we've been converting the G144 design so that it will reproduce in GLOW the same layout that we get from uh, OCAP. And when that's done, then we will be in a position to make a new chip if we can find a way to get out of fab without um, spending more money than we have to do it. But in the meanwhile, the purpose right now is to do as much useful stuff as we can and try to get Polysense up and running while we find a fab that's willing to do business with us directly or find another way of, of getting access to a fab without having to go through our friends at Moses. Finally, um, it was bad enough to lose Jeff Fox, but it sucks totally to have lost Bill Munch. And we are very, very sad to be doing now without an excellent man and a wonderful member of our team. And all I can say is RIP, Bill. So that's where we're at. We're going to be doing a lot more of the same during the next year, and I hope that we'll have a lot more useful stuff to report than we do now as of next fourth day. However, that's where we stand at the moment. Here's again where to find all of our nice data. And thank you much. So with that, I guess we're ready for another Q&A and then a quick break before Chuck takes over. Hi, Greg. This is Kevin Appert. Uh, I was wondering if I wanted an evaluation board, not that I personally do, but if somebody that's watching does, uh, are they available? Uh, how much do they cost? What would I do to get one other than to go to your website and search it? Uh, they are available straight on the website at the product page. And the price is $495, and they're generally shipped within two days. And the, uh, we do have the funds to make as many more as we need to, so there's no problem with that. The uh, assembly house and the fab house are actually the PCB fab company and the assembly house are co-owned by the same folks, so we can get a really rapid turnaround around our more batches of them. But at any rate, we have, we've done our A batch of 100, which is our usual size batch, and about 20% of those are shipped. At what point in the far distant past you guys were running sort of a read arrays product development kibbutz where you just go there somewhere and reside there and pay oh, for your own food? About the and slave labor program. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. well, several people have taken advantage of that. And learned Is that still a thing? Would you contemplate? someone coming to visit you, other than me, uh, to, uh, to do that. I want to, you know, that I don't want to give anybody ideas, but yes, I want to give people ideas that they can uh, perhaps participate in a brave new era of green race development. Someone young. Well, the first person to take advantage of that program in earnest was Stefan Norris. And because Stefan will be here with four other Swiss next, the latter part of next July, um, that slot is occupied. However, Stefan took advantage of the program. Um, look, there's a list of people that are on the website that have, some of whom I think are there in the room. Yes, I mean, the, the point is you have to be willing to do something useful for green arrays. And the most common activity was producing a good app node. And in exchange for that, we're happy to provide some hardware to produce the app node. Let me also add that especially in California under the new provisions of the Assembly Bill 5 that was passed, I believe, in September, it's no longer possible for us to pay somebody in California with a 1099, huh? Because that would be wrong. <laughs> no, it would be against the new law in California. Like we, they have to become our employees. Well, the you know, they, they threw the baby out with the bathwater to the point where they, they didn't want the Uber drivers and 
and such to be slave labor. Uh, they were, but this is what happens when you let authoritarians run a state. Let's tell you. thousand dollars just to exist in California as a corporation. What cost in Wyoming? Uh, uh, Eighteen dollars, something like that. Fifty-two bucks. Oh, okay. I remember uh, a guy who ran a small store said that you know when he opened many many years ago, you know he needed all of these forms and to pay for all of these licenses and permits and da 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 da. So when he was done in California, he put his he was up in the mountains at a lake. Uh, with a general store and a fishing guide business. So he put a snow shovel on the top of his roof and he drove until somebody said, what's that thing strapped to your roof? And he found that you know it cost him about what you pay to start a business selling uh, bowls and uh, lived happily ever after. Any other questions for Greg? All right. Greg, um, thank you. Say, though, to your point, if anyone would like to work with us and make something useful come out of the effort, just get a hold of me, Greg, at and uh, let's work something out. And let's say one wanted to read one of those app notes. Where would them go? They would go to our website, which was up on that. Yeah, we, we saw it. It's, <laughs> I suspect everybody here is smart enough to know that, but I... I just wanted to make the point that, yes, they're still online and available and interesting to look at. But well, we're not going anywhere unless, unless somehow we cannot either get some chips moving in quantity, which this, this customer with the GPS has the promise of doing. We're now down on the tail end of their acquiring phony cycle, so we might actually be getting something going with that. Or, or at least if we can get PolySense operating, that would be good. The, the goal, again, with PolySense is that that outfit will produce its own features next time. It all sounds... So that means we're all dead and gone. We don't have a running customer. The main range chips are still here. It all sounds so wonderful. Well, we, we wish you the very best of luck with it. And I, I hope you find participants from among our numbers and, and move on with it. Uh, well, so they're going to be needed because the, the goal is, in fact, to distribute the Public Sons training program nationally. Some of it will be done on the net via tech tools that we make available on our, our website, but there still need to be local mentors who understand something about all this. And certainly the starting point is what the mentor is teaching about for it, except in this case there's actually a business, a non-profit business involved in teaching people about for it. With that, I'd like to thank the speaker. And we're going to take a short break. And uh, for those listening at home, we'll be uh, switching to the other video stream uh, at this time. So there'll be a separate stream for for Chuck's talk. All right. Because nothing is simple. There's plenty more soda in the back. That's the diet root beer. It's bad for you. Chuck, I'll get I've got a, uh, a small 